Hey guys, welcome back to another dev video with New World. We're gonna go over quite a few things today. We have a long list, so let's dive right in. The first thing that we're gonna talk about is we're gonna deep dive into March. We're gonna go over the weapons in combat. We're also gonna go back into reducing friction. I know it was requested that we go into a little bit more detail. We're gonna go over upcoming events, customer support, which is another big question, community questions actually from the forums and streamers, and then finally, the roadmap. And with me today is Scott Lane, and how are you feeling about all that? I'm excited. Like, like We've been wanting to talk about a lot of this for a long time, especially the roadmap, but there's a ton of great content in today's episode, so let's, uh, Let's get started. All right. Okay, guys, so we are gonna go into a deep dive with the upcoming stuff. Um, joining me today is Rob Chesney, Mike Willette, and Charles Bradbury, our art director. Um, so we're gonna go a little bit into the art side of things too, which is really exciting. Uh, let's just start off with what are the pieces of new content that March is going to be experiencing? Well, we're real excited about this. So we have a brand new expedition, the Tempest's Heart, which is the Mertgard expedition. And this is kind of like the whole finale of the Isabella arc, uh, which is part of our story. And so Rob's going to dig into that in just a sec. I just want to get out a couple other things we're doing first. <laughs> we're super excited about it. And then we're also introducing a, a brand new weapon type, uh, the blunderbuss. Right. So it's a, a mid-ranged uh, weapon uh, that uh, basically scales off of strength. And, and, and we're really excited about those two additions that are coming. But we should definitely dive right back into Yeah, the I Tempest mean, this is the diving deep, so you're just giving us a little taste now. I mean... You want to talk about the story, or you want to talk about the art first? The story? Like, oh, yeah. We can touch either. I mean, there's there's so many new additions to it because you're you're diving into the mind of Isabella. So <laughs> what we've, we've tried to, like, this is one of our larger expeditions, multiple bosses, multiple encounters against Isabella, uh, and some transformative, if you will. <laughs> and, and then uh, some kind of, like, new set pieces that are just awe-inspiring and super interesting. I think that's actually a really good place to start is yeah. like that ev yeah, evoking that story visually. Yeah, so it. Tempest Heart, we really wanted this to like push the limits of what we could do visually with a with an expedition space. Like this is sort of a surreal, like supernatural dive into an alternate reality space, yeah. like looking at if a space is like totally taken over by corruption and chaos, like how do we express that? And also digging into like Isabella's story a little bit. And we wanted really big set pieces to kind of showcase that and like feel really different than something players have experienced before and, and have this like big final showdown with Isabella in a really cool space. Yeah. And so, that, I mean, that's, you know, if you've been following the story, that's the culmination of the entire main story arc from the, uh, the beginning of the game when you first wash up on the beach. But one of the things that, you know, I, I think is super cool about it, I mean, is that the whole idea of Eternum and this idea where, um, you know, it's an island where everyone lives forever. Death is no longer the threat. But the threats are actually, you know, they're more, they're more psychological. You know, they're threats of, of insanity. They're th threats of despair. They're threats of corruption. And like, so this whole idea of um, Isabella and like the way she's embraced corruption, it, it is, it's a psychological thing. And that's why the, the final realization of it is like going into the, you know, the core of her power is going into her mind and, and the, the way that she fell to corruption. As players go through, they'll, you know, they'll get to see uh, little vignettes showing uh, pieces of Isabella's story from the past. And, uh, and you'll even meet a character um, who has a personal connection to Isabella uh, outside the expedition who will uh, who is really interested in uh, uncovering all of her story. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah, there'll be a lot more, I mean, all of Isabella's story, I guess, is revealed here that uh, that we haven't shown so far. So it's yeah, pretty there's, exciting. There's a ton of like little Easter eggs therein. Like we put a bunch of like hidden side things that you can collect and, and utilize in order to unlock other things. Uh, the repeatable quests that are like outside of the expedition that you can gain uh, delve into like, other little corners of like her personality and why is she is the is way Barkimides she is. Is Barkamides there? That's, that's... No, 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 no. Barkamides does not travel. All right, fine. He waits for Simon. Oh, okay. All right, <laughs> fine. All right. I, I love, I love his outdoor quest. Or is he sitting outside just like wanting more bones? Yeah. But these ones are really focused <laughs> on like, like finding out what made her the way that she is, and also the reflection of like her mental state and. And having no reprieve and constantly being at the at the will of these forces of corruption and then her own kind of like desires. So we hope players are 
find it fascinating and, and beautiful and, and creepy all at the same time. Yeah. yeah. So you're talking a lot about wrapping up like the main storyline, right? But th this isn't the end of the game. You're, you're just getting warmed up. So where, you know, where is the story going to be going next? Yeah, it's pretty exciting. And, uh, you know, when players finally do defeat Isabella, uh, we actually have a, a cinematic that, that foreshadows what's coming up. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, and really, you know, if you look back at, at the story arc so far, like, you know, players have, have been introduced to the Angry Earth. They've learned about the Solus Lost. Um, and these, this ancient civilization that was here before that, uh, that there's just a huge amount of mystery surrounding. Um, and, you know, without giving too much away, obviously, I mean, those are, these are the mysteries that we're going to explore as we go forward. And we're going to deal with these different um, groups. And, you know, corruption may not be the threat in the next story arc. Um, but precisely like some of the forces and the characters that the player encountered um, in the main storyline so far will we'll be coming back and perhaps like, you know, not as friendly as you thought they were in your mm. first uh, meeting. Suspicious. <laughs> yeah, I was going to jump on that in this expedition, in the cinematic, and kind of beyond that, I think we're really looking at how we tell story and trying to come up with new ways to like present narrative and story to the player so they can like ingest it in, in new and interesting ways that kind of ups the ante for the whole game a little bit, which I think is exciting. I love cutscenes, all that, so that, that's great to hear. Since we're talking about story elements, I want to go back to the blunderbuss. So blunderbuss is our, our brand new weapon, mid-range weapon, scales on strength and intelligence. There's two different trees. One where you play up close, you're like kind of like glued to your opponent with different ways to like control them with like uh, grappling hooks and netting and big spread shots. And the other one is more like keep away where you can blast opponents back and then land grenade shots on them and a bunch of cool stuff. So I love the dichotomy there. But what's interesting to me is that you've also incorporated that into like the legendary weapon quest. I think that's really awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the weapon's really awesome. As so many of our weapons are, it's really visceral feeling like when you're playing with it. Um, but yeah, for the story, we had a lot of fun kind of dreaming up what the story could be. And, uh, and it actually comes down to the conflict between a designer and an engineer as they're trying to build the <laughs> ultimate blunderbuss, which is something that's very familiar to us in game development. We're always navigating these waters of, of different perspectives and how different disciplines kind of bring, uh, you know, different uh, priorities to each thing that we work on. And I think this will be, you know, a fun little story for players to play through. And then at the end, of course, you get the, the badass blunderbuss that's, uh, that's the common, you know, that everything that anybody would want. Okay, well, I mean, anything else that you want to add to this section of, of the dev video? Oh, well, it's not just that stuff that we're working on. We're constantly, like, there's going to be a ton of bug fixes, a lot of quality of life improvements that are being made, uh, like, some of which are we're creating a lot more solo options for the MSQ, so you're not required to actually run ex certain what expeditions. The MSQ so is? For the uninitiated, the MSQ is our, our main story quests or the main story line. So uh, a lot of times you would have to enter an expedition in order to, to accomplish that leg of your journey. And Rob's team has done an awesome job of putting in alternatives for solo players so they can also, you know, hit those points and keep moving along their path just in case you know they don't have group access or they really feel like playing as a solo player and just that's their deal. Yeah, and it's nice because I play with my friends, but at the time they actually had all done it and then when it was my turn to do it, you know, I didn't have anyone to, you know, do it with. And then I was just like, well, this is awkward. So, so your friends wouldn't come back and play with you? Like, wow. No, I know. I need new friends. <laughs> Gotta check them friends. So, yeah. Anyway. But that's great to hear that now you're like, okay, no problem. I'll do it myself. So. Yeah. And in, in addition to that, just a couple of little highlights that we'll touch upon later is that uh, tons of updates to POIs. Uh, we've added a lot more for... Uh, rewards for just exploring the world, so more dynamic events, roadside encounters, uh, new wandering enemies, updates to wholesale POIs, and we're going to talk about that stuff later. But we've also added uh, infinite ammo to weapons. We'll talk about that later. Uh, in addition, uh, one real big thing that I love, just because we love running expeditions, is now only one member of your party actually needs to be at the entrance of an expedition for everyone to participate. So oh. now you don't have to have the minimum requirement of three present in the area. It's just as long as one person in your party is there, everyone else will get teleported in. That's so I think that's, that's awesome because, yeah, instead of having to wait for everyone to get there. Now, my question is then is when they leave... Do they leave out of the dungeon or do they get teleported back they to where they were? They go back to where they were. 
oh, all right, so I could be in the middle farming some ore and they should, pull me in. Should operate and... just like uh, Outpost Rush. Okay, awesome. That's Yeah, that's great news. I'll throw, I'll throw out one other thing that we're adding that, uh, you know, a lot of, I mean, players who are deep into the game may not as pre appreciate as much, but uh, we're streamlining some of the early quests in the main story. Um, like improving the storytelling and making the uh, the quest objectives a little bit more exciting and a lot more clear, um, and to the point that Charles made earlier, like e you know even now we're we're looking back through early parts of the game and looking for opportunities to improve the storytelling and certainly the the presentation quality mm -hmm. of the storytelling. Right. So. Okay. Ongoing. That's great news. All right, guys. Thank you so much for giving me all this great information with the deep dive, and I can't wait to experience it all myself. So, all right. Thank you. Now we're going to get into the weapons and combat part of the video. Joining me today is David Verifayi and Dave Hall, and we're going to be going into some of the questions that I pulled from the forums from you guys. So the first one for you all today is the musket and the blunderbuss. Uh, as we mentioned before, the musket is one of the you know lesser used weapons. What was the plan to bring now in the blunderbuss, which is you know many looking outside in is very similar. But if you want to go into greater detail about that, yeah, I think you know we believe the musket has a pretty cool place in the weapon pantheon, so to speak, of New World. Uh, the musket's obviously long range, uh, but the blunderbuss brings this cool short range gameplay. Uh, another big thing is it's a strength-based ranged weapon, which I think is going to be really important, right? Like it opens up different builds, different opportunities. You don't have to go dex now to get a ranged element. Right. Uh, and then lastly, it brings some pretty cool mobility stuff that I think is going to sort of change up the gameplay and get people interested about the weapon. Okay. All right. So it's more of like a shotgun effect and yeah. a little shorter, closer to you. Yeah. All right. That's exciting to know. Um, you know, as you said, Dave, can you go into detail about the blunderbuss that we're going to be getting? Absolutely. Yeah. So as as Dave mentioned, it's more of a short to mid range weapon with a high focus on mobility. It's uh, it has two trees that we have right now. One is the containment tree. Containment tree is mainly about getting close to your enemy, keeping them there, and then unloading basically a bunch of shotgun shells in their face, right? Like it's a very powerful, violent <laughs> weapon, so I love it. Um, and it's uh, some of the uh, other abilities. I got the claw shot, which is probably my favorite ability in the game, which okay. is actually you hit the enemy with it and it draws you into the enemy. So oh. uh, it puts you right in the perfect position to blast them. Um, we also have the net shot, which will slow them down if they're trying to get away from you. And then we also have the Azoth Blast, which is kind of the high damage, close range one. Once you get in there, you can use it. Our other tree is the, uh, the uh, Chaos Tree. This one's a little more mid-range. Uh, we're gonna have splitting grenades, uh, a mortar shot, which is actually just an entirely different game mode, basically switches you into it. Uh, and you can just rain down damage from like mid-range around there. Anybody gets close, we have the uh, the burst shot, which is gonna knock them down so you can get away from them at that point. So a lot of really fun ones in there and a lot of good mobility on them. A lot of the shots will move you backwards, wow. uh, do a little things like that, so. I could see it also driving the opponents insane with you, you know, the shotgun sounds like you're gonna be moving around a yeah. lot, so. Yeah, I think it's cool, cause like the two trees offer sort of different styles, right? Like one's about, it's a little more on the DPS side, right? It's about like engaging with one player, moving towards them, slowing them down, doing some damage. Uh, and then the chaos tree is a little more about disruption. Like it'll be powerful in wars, uh, might be good in some tank builds. Like I, th I think it's gonna give oh, a lot yeah, of diversity. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, now you're bringing in, you know, another weapon, the first weapon that you're bringing in. And well, no, I guess the Void Gauntlet, Gauntlet and now the Blunderbuss. And, you know, something that gets thrown around a lot is the meta. You know, what weapons are the meta? What, you, you know, what's the favorite of everyone? Do you guys take into consideration what, you know, the meta is at the time um, when creating weapons or bringing weapons in? Uh, we definitely consider meta for balance purposes, right? Like, I think which weapons are being used very highly, uh, you know, is an indication of how strong they are, right? Like people generally don't use the worst weapons. So uh, we definitely look at that and affects our choices and balance. I wouldn't say it's the only thing, right? Like sometimes there's just fun things people enjoy, uh, but it, it gives us places to really investigate and like, oh, all right, everyone's using this ability or this weapon or this build. We need to take a closer look at that. Right. Speaking of taking a closer look, we bring up the Void Gauntlet once again. Yes. It's currently still kicking butt in um, PvP, things like that. Are you guys looking deeper into that again? Uh, we are looking into it a little bit. I think, uh, you know, one of the things we've heard is that, you know, why is the Void Gauntlet like the best weapon for PvP crowd control, right? And I think those are the types of statements that I think really 
you know, we're considering, because that wasn't the original vision for the, for the weapon, right? Like the weapon was really supposed to be more of a, a debuffing type weapon, uh, a support weapon to, you know, support your team. Uh, and also, you know, a little bit of off healing. So that part of it is something we didn't really want it to be front and center. So that's something we're going to be looking at. Okay. And then bringing the blunderbuss in again, you know, it's considering the meta and the balancing, you know, you look at it, the, the whole entire picture. It's not just one specific weapon. Yeah, I think in terms of new weapons, we consider meta a little bit less when building a new weapon, just because weapons take a long time to build, right? So the meta is going to shift, you know, two, three times in, in the amount of time it takes us to build a weapon. So yeah. meta is less of a concern. Instead, we look at like, you know, what is the role of all the weapons? Does this have a unique place in the sort of weapon uh, pantheon? You know, mm -hmm. does it provide some new and different gameplay? That's mostly what we think about with new weapons. All right. And then, I mean, you know, we're here for weapons in combat. Um, let's just talk about, is there anything else that you guys would like to add when it comes to the weapons in combat in game? Absolutely. One of the things we're adding in March is an in and out of combat state. And it's something we're going to keep adding on to and attaching things to. The first thing we've done is when you're out of combat, you will have a constant regen now on your character. So that's going to help you get back into battle much, much faster. And I think it's going to be a, a really big boon for the early players and and for the late level players too. So. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Well, that's very exciting for people just diving into that. So thank you guys so much for joining me and that's it for the weapons in combat. Okay, so this section is about reducing friction. We did touch a bit about this last month and we've even made more changes since then and we're talking about making more changes in the future. So we're gonna talk about that because that's why we're here, surprise. Um, so guys, last month, how were the first changes you know, accepted? What were some things that we worked on? Uh, I think it went overall really well. Players really seem to like the changes to fast travel. I think that was the big one. Now you can zip around the map. The Azoth cost is, you know, almost negligible. Uh, and I think that's great. Uh, other big wins, I think the housing tax reduction, people really noticed. Uh, we did some loosening of orbs uh, for expeditions. There's more to do there. Uh, but I think overall, the reception has been good. I think, you know, we probably should have done some of this earlier, but we're on it and, and we're going to keep working on it. Yeah, it's awesome to see that we're gathering more and more feedback from the forums and you guys are getting more and more comfortable with changing certain things and, and finding a nice balance. Can we go into detail of some things that are going to be coming up in different changes? Yeah, for March we have some pretty big changes coming in also. Uh, the first one is you're going to be able to move while you're in your inventory. Uh, so we call it. It's a, it's a big deal. <laughs> nice. You're going to be able to move your equipment around, do whatever you need to do as you're running around the, uh, the world. So it's going to be a really big change, really nice quality of life there. Uh, some of the other ones, uh, a, a big one is the infinite ammo. So for our, mm -hmm. uh, our range weapons, you're going to have infinite ammo. So if you have T1 ammo right now, it's going to be automatically upgraded to T2, uh, Tier 2. So uh, no losses there, and it's going to be just once you get a weapon, you can use it as long as you want. So uh, no worries there. Uh, some of the other good ones, uh, we're going to be able to sign up for war and invasion from the maps. Um, oh, okay, nice so you don't have to go to it. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then... When you do sell back your house nowadays, you're gonna get 50% back, which is pretty nice. Uh, a, a little uh, extra cash there. Um, we're also gonna increase the rewards for invasion and war, get a, get a little more uh, rewards there for the people participating. And then um, I think, uh, oh, and then the durability loss. So one of the things we did is like, you're only gonna lose uh, durability on the items that you have equipped, nothing in your inventory oh, and not okay. your tools either. So that's so, great, yeah. especially when you're going around and doing all your harvesting runs and things like that. Okay. And expeditions also. And expeditions, yeah. big. That's true, absolutely. So, and then I feel like I'm forgetting one or two. Well, my biggest one, my favorite one, because I do a lot of crafting and I've got stuff everywhere in mm -hmm. every separate town. So uh, in March, we're gonna do something big. You can now move stuff from any town uh, to any other town for free, regardless of faction. So wow. if you know right now in game, you have to, your faction has to own both the right. town you're in and the town you're taking stuff from, and there's a gold cost. It'll be free, and there is no longer a faction requirement, which basically means you can get stuff from anywhere. It's like it's our first step towards a more global storage system. System. Okay, wow, that is huge, especially because I have cooking stuff, you know, in this storage, you know, all my special spell stuff in another storage, and, and now I don't have to travel to do those things. I can stay in one area. Yeah. And I guess that's good, too, because some towns, um, you know, don't have the right tables. Yep. So now you can now go to the places with the right tables 
and you're still able to access all your stuff. So, all right, that's absolutely, I mean, I'm a huge fan of that. And I mean, is there even anything else, any more to come after all of that? Uh, yeah, so longer term, there's definitely still stuff we're looking at. Uh, you know, this is gonna take a little bit longer to get to some of this, uh, but one of the things we're looking at is salvaging. Uh, you know, you get a lot of gear in our game because the way it works that might not be interesting to you. Uh, and salvaging right now is a little unrewarding. It's not celebrated well. So that's something we're definitely looking into. Like if you get a, a pretty cool weapon, but it's just not right for you, that you can at least salvage it for something that's interesting. Some other changes like, uh, you know, the faction control points and uh, the territory upgrade bonuses that people get. A lot of those have sort of become less useful now with some of these friction changes we've made it. So we're going to be adjusting a lot of those and retuning them. Uh, and we may even give players a way to sort of reset the choices they made in standing bonuses. So oh. uh, they can make choices, you know, especially now that you're 60, wow. a lot yeah, of those experience Yeah, I was going to say, all the experience bonuses yeah. that are now just a waste. So, so. Some of that stuff's further in the future, uh, but it, we're working on it. Uh, and another one, I think, you know, uh, Expedition Orbs is a, a continual mm -hmm. topic. Uh, we made some, I think, starting to make some good changes in, in February with giving more access. But I think we've got a, more ways to go there. I think our... Our vision for the future is, is a world where orbs aren't required uh, for expeditions, but instead uh, potentially buff the, the rewards you get from them. So uh, okay. we're still working on that. It's going to take a little while, but uh, that's sort of where we want to go in the future with that. Yeah, that's great news. I know the forums are constantly talking about the orbs. We hear you guys, you know, wanting to remove them, wanting to change things. So hearing that this is something that you guys are taking seriously is a a really important thing yeah. and hopefully that will reassure the players that we are listening and we're constantly working on reducing that friction when it comes to any sort of content for them. All right, thank you so much, guys. All right, guys, so we're gonna dive into the upcoming events. So, uh, well, let me first actually introduce this great bunch of people that we have with us. We have Phil Bolas, we have Mike Willette, and we have Katie Kaczynski. And like I said, we're gonna go into some of the upcoming events. So guys, take it. What are we doing with the upcoming events? What's going on? Well, let's talk about a current event that we've got going on right now. So if you remember on March 9th, we kicked off a big event where we gave uh, viewers on Twitch a preview of our Tempest's Heart lair, uh, and our very own Mike Willette mm -hmm. ran a dungeon uh, very successfully, potentially, uh, with um, some... <laughs> Let's just say it was great. It was great. <laughs> he had no problems. They're great carries, weren't they, Mike? Absolutely. They're the best. <laughs> the best. Uh, <laughs> and uh, with that event, though, uh, we also uh, rolled out an amazingly awesome drop uh, that's still going on right now. Uh, right now, viewers watching New World can earn are what we're calling the indigo eyes, and they're flaming, fiery so eyes. So cool. Very cool, looks awesome um, that they can earn. It's an exclusive Twitch drop, and that's happening. It's gonna be running through March 21st, okay. uh, leading right up to our, our next, our big March release. Okay, and I mean, that's pretty exciting. I mean, I don't think we've had anything to do with eyes yet, so that'll be the first one. So mm -hmm. that's really exciting. And along with events, what else have we added into the world with things like that? Oh, there's, there's a bunch of new stuff that went into the world that we're pretty excited about. One of the first things that we added was a, a brand new set of collectibles that we're calling Vista Views. So these are our world paintings. There's two easels per zone that are discoverable that are placed out there. So as you search around and looking for awesome views, you might find one of these easels and then you can procure a painting and those paintings can be placed into your house and just kind oh, of like showcase. So it's kind of like this okay. cool little thing that you could just earn a place in your That's house. That's awesome. Uh, and there's two per zone. And if you, if you happen to lose one of your paintings for whatever reason, 24 hours later, you can go, about, go back to the same spot and, and pick that up. In addition to that, uh, we've added a loot goblin of sorts that just roams <laughs> around all of Eternum. Its name is Raffle Bones and just basically collects all the stuff from everywhere. Obviously. Uh, obviously. Yeah. Uh, this golden character that just roams about and if you can defeat Raffle Bones before Raffle Bones decides to destroy itself, you get to collect some really cool items. So uh, usually Raffle Bones is uh, leveled to the, the level of the zone, uh, okay. but uh, regardless, if you're if you catch Raffle Bones, you get a cool piece of gear to your level or to that zone, but you also get a gypsum orb. Mm -hmm. And if you defeat a level 60 Raffle Bones, then you can actually get, I think it's 500 Umbral Shards. It's a big Umbral Shard reward for actually finding and, and great. putting him down before he poofs out of there. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So keep an eye out for, for old Raffle Bones. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
And so leaving Winter Convergence, uh, some of the Yetis forgot to, you know, get oh, the memo no. and they're supposed to take off. So they're, now there's still some roaming Yetis that exist in Great Cleave. And so you can defeat them for like really cool gear at around level 45. Uh, we also uh, did some big updates uh, into the lower levels of the world as well. So uh, Unbound Island and Cutlass Keys got a major upgrade. So go see Boatswain Benjamin there. Uh, so that's cool questing in your 30s. Uh, as well as Weaver's Fen, we've added uh, Stinky the Hunter. Uh, and so this is a new uh, roaming NPC who also has a shack. So you can try to find and discover Stinky around your mid 30s. And Stinky has three named drops that are pretty exciting. Oh, okay. So that's some good uh, gear to go after if you're just getting started and you're on your, your way through Weavers. The return we, of Stinky. The return, yes, the return, the return of, of Stinky. <laughs> I mean, we've no encountered his outhouse. <laughs> yes, we've encountered his shack. And I've always been curious about Stinky. It's upgraded fully. That's I amazing. mean, we've gone from outhouse to slightly bigger than outhouse. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting. Excellent uh, news. Excellent news. Uh, also in Weaver's Fen and Restless Shores, we've added dynamic roadside encounters. So you okay. should just see random enemies working on stuff oh. or, or planning things or roaming about. So those are interesting new ads. Um, and then I think Andromedus is the latest addition to Weaver's that we've done a, another upgrade on for that POI. Okay. So, yeah. Wow. All Maybe right. Those, so there. I mean, just, yeah. Just a, just just a, few, a few things. things. So I was not cool. expecting that. I was like, yeah. oh, did you have like one thing or two things? Yeah. That's, was... Along with all of our normal bug list. fixing, when we dig into the zones, we're like, right. oh, we see opportunities to add like you know just more dynamic moments or just add a lot more you know variety. So we're taking that to heart. Right. And we know our players want more stuff, so I'm And I love to, to see the return of the infamous Stinky in such yeah. a celebratory way. That's so cool. <laughs> what brought, on, what brought on the decision yeah. to bring him back? You know what? It, it was unfortunate that there was a bug associated with Stinky originally, like a long time ago, where you could just generate a, a ton of Stinkies by interacting with this outhouse. <laughs> it was That actually insane. sounds wrong when you say it out loud, <laughs> I was going to say, but... But we, we, we love the idea, so that's why you know, it had to make a comeback. Stinky, right. Stinky essentially made an impression on us and so probably so. the people who were uh, a part of the, the Stinky Bug, as we so lovingly refer <laughs> to <laughs> it on the team. But yeah, we uh, we came in game and Stinky was bringing down the servers because people were spawning. Oh, so many. So many Stinkies. It was, it was insane. Uh, but then we fixed the Stinky Bug and Stinky no longer appears there. Oh. So this, this so return of Stinky. stinky. Oh, now it came back. <laughs> All right. Well yeah, then. Stinky might be lingering a little too long, so we'll move along. But you know, check it out if you go to Weavers. Well, that is definitely good to know. And I, I love collectibles. I love the little things that you just stumble upon and you mm -hmm. got to tell your friends and, and, and have them come join. Now, with friends being on other regions, can we talk a little bit about the region transfers? Sure. So uh, it's, not, it's not ready yet as of the time of this filming, um, but we have been working very, very hard on it. It's currently in testing, okay. um, but we will let folks know as soon as it is ready. Um, but... Uh, cross-region transfers is on the very soon trademark uh, horizon <laughs> uh, horizon um, no we've heard players we know that they they want that possibility we know that it launched some people chose regions that they thought they were going to be able to move and that they weren't able to so we're making that a possibility and it is coming out soon uh, and they should stay tuned to the forums and twitter because our social media and community managers are going to be announcing that so yep and when that comes out, it will be accessible through the shop, uh, and players can access it there and then choose to go wherever they need to go. Yeah, very similar to the transfer tokens mm -hmm. uh, right. as far as where it is for right. them. Right, yeah. so this gives people a little heads up. Start doing your homework and figuring out yeah. where you and your friends <laughs> want to go. So, exactly. all right, that's great to know. And then now that hopefully we're getting also more new people with add in the friends. Mm -hmm. We want to talk about Double XP Weekend. That was another thing that you guys came up with. Uh, definitely. So shortly after we launch the March build, we're going to be rolling out a Double XP Weekend. And that's for player XP. So players who uh, may, may not be at max level yet or returning to the game can come in and for a weekend, about you know about three days, we'll probably be running it for, uh, 
they'll be able to earn, you know, twice as much character XP as they would for doing it, you know, any of anything that generates that in the game. Okay, but Phil, uh, as a level 60, um, oh. I don't really care about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Us. so I, I, I know, Phil. I know that there is the well, bearing a level 17, of a lead. You know, it's oh. very important. Okay, get Phil out of here. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, isn't there something for me though? Of course. Yeah. Yes, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Uh, also, not just with character XP, but we're releasing the blunderbuss weapon, right, with this release. And therefore, in that same weekend, we're going to be also doing a double weapon mastery XP for the blunderbuss. Nice. So all players, not just the 60s, uh, but also the 60s, can <laughs> uh, <laughs> earn twice as much uh, weapon mastery with the blunderbuss anytime they're using it in combat. So it'll help you, you know, uh, level up some of the early skills, unlock a few skills and perks faster with the blunderbuss, maybe, I don't know, twice as fast. I think that's what double means. So yes. Yeah, agreed. Twice. Anyway. <laughs> All right, well that's great to know that both the 17s and the 60s uh, <laughs> will get a little bit of action, so I appreciate yeah, that, and guys. The, and the, the level 30 players are in Cutlass Keys to go into Unbound Island to see Boatswain Benjamin. <laughs> you really have a thing for Benjamin, don't you? He's awesome. All right, thank you so much, guys. Yeah, thank you. Okay, guys, now we have a group of amazing people here that you have not met before. This is the player support or part of the player support team. Um, so I want to introduce Rachel Barnum and Brad Wilcox. And then Katie is also here to uh, join us with a, a little fun I know, topic. I know a little bit. Fun <laughs> topic bit. of uh, player support and moderation. So, I mean, let's dive right into it, guys. Um, how does moderation work? What's going on? on. Yeah, absolutely. So when players make reports in games, we have a moderation system that they go into. Um, depending on the severity, depending on um, some other factors, eventually they can be turned into a case against that player. Um, we have real life moderators that take a look at that case um, and they determine based on the information from those player reports, they might go hang out in your chat log, see what else has been going on and any based on your past history with penalties. Um, they'll go ahead and make a decision on whether or not to penalize you and how severe that penalty will be. For those penalties, we do also have a peer review process and we have an auditing process as well. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit how fast the turnaround is with these processes? Yeah, sure. So we work towards an SLA or we try to have all player reports at least looked at within three hours. Now this can vary based on the volume that we get. Um, and also different reports are maybe categorized a little bit different and some are, at, some are responded to or viewed much quicker than others. But ultimately, we look and, and do a good job at, at getting everything looked at within three hours. Okay, that's awesome. That's great to know. And I know the question uh, players are constantly asking, guys, is bots. How many bots have been banned? So good question. And yeah, I think that seems to be uh, a common question that everyone wants to know. You know, you need to know that we're body, we are banning bots constantly. It's 24 by 7. And it's very safe to say that over the last... A uh, few months, we have banned tens of thousands of bots. Okay. Well, in addition to that, we also, uh, the dev team with um, our player support team, we've done some actual, like, you know, GM in game actions against bots. So you've probably seen some folks asking in chat, hey, anybody got eyes on a bot? Mm -hmm. uh, we have like locations that we've looked at that we're aware of. Again, like when they report in game and they say there was a bot in this location, we see the location in the report and we, we tag that and that's what we've been using. Uh, in addition to just where we've seen bots right, <laughs> ourselves. Right, right. Um, so we have been doing that as kind of an additional action on top of this for those bots that, you know, we've heard folks say like they've seen the same bot in game for a while, yeah. right? Because they don't fall into any particular um, pattern that we've seen. And so it's been extremely helpful getting uh, getting those bots and people in game to ban them. So it's Yeah, fun. it's very satisfying yeah. when you're like, oh, oh we, were on, we were all on a call. We're like, got one, <laughs> got them, we got this like and everybody. Cool. Yeah, everybody was like, God, yeah, so amazing. And then one guy was like, I haven't gotten one, guys. Aww. <laughs> well, that brings up a good question then, too. How do you, how, you know, how does, how does player support determine that a bot is a bot and not a player? Yeah, so like Katie mentioned one part, but before I kind of go into that, 
there's some systematic ways that we, we determine this too. So we have systems that actually are detecting bot type, cheat type software. Uh, and those are the easy ones because it immediately is detected on the PCs. We know that it's running. And so those will automatically be banned right away. The second thing that we kind of do that's more of a systematic thing is we have telemetry and analytics that basically are looking for outliers and normal player behavior. And that then creates these reports, not just player reports, but other reports that can be investigated. Uh, the third way is the player reports. That's where we get all of the help from the community and we really appreciate it uh, because it does allow us to double check those systematic reports, but then also takes us to the fourth thing, which Katie just mentioned, and we, we, we have uh, game masters, admins, whatever you want to call it, in-game, um, looking at those player reports and validating the reports that we get. And it is satisfying. It is a lot of fun. <laughs> it's so um, good. <laughs> and I like to see it. I don't know if players know this, but when, a, when someone is banned, they actually, it looks kind of like their log off type sequence. So they lay down and go to sleep. <laughs> And we know it's a permanent sleep. And they don't, they don't wake up. Oh, no, it just got dark. They're done. Oh, bye, bye. <laughs> <laughs> well, what if somebody would like to appeal? It, you know, what is the appeal process? Yeah. So whether it's player reports or maybe you got caught up in the bot system, which maybe you shouldn't be appealing for that one, but that's okay. But yeah, if you get caught up in the player reports, you feel like your um, penalty or ban is unjustified. Uh, you can reach out on our support site. All of those appeals go to one of our more advanced moderation teams that take a look through it. And if they have any questions, any doubts, um, especially in the case of um, potentially you did get caught up in the boss, maybe you just really like fishing, I don't know. <laughs> um, those issues do get escalated to us. Um, and so us on the game team do take a look at those appeals and we'll go through your history and everything. So those appeals are taken very seriously. Okay. I remember some of the wars, you know, would happen and all of a sudden people would be screaming, oh, we got mass reported or we're, you know, that group got mass reported. Can you go into a little bit more detail about that situation, about mass reporting? Is it a thing? Is it not a thing? How does that work? Yeah. So it is a thing. Yeah, and unfortunately, there are uh, bad actors and especially can happen in company PVP type situations where players will mass report other players and try to troll them or get them kicked out of the game. We have a very hard and fast rule that the number of reports doesn't matter. What really matters is the context behind those reports. A lot of context is passed on with the reports, the location, uh, chat messages, you know, all of the player information. So that shouldn't be an issue. It, it never should be an issue. But mistakes happen, and it, it has happened before, uh, where someone is just like, they got reported, it, might, it, it must happen. Uh, but we really do have standard operating procedure to look at the context to make sure that it, there is proof. Uh, the moderation process, if it, do, if it can't be seen and it can't be found, they need to look into it and do a deeper dive and look for additional context to see if they can really do that. The last thing is too, that just to, to, to add to that is, if players are doing that, if they're mass reporting someone and trolling them and trying to get out of the game, Guess that's what? a violation of the code yes, of conduct as well. Is. And we will and yeah. do take actions, <laughs> yes. which could put them for them. that permanent sleep. Yeah. yeah. Right. So if you're yeah. planning on mass reporting for a nefarious purpose and not because somebody legitimately has broken the code of conduct or terms of use, you can expect to... Uh, mm. To maybe get a little penalty Bite there. The hand that feeds. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. right. I guess my last question is just in general, what is the best way to report stuff? Is it in game? Is it forums? Like where? Where's the most helpful for you? Um, and also too, when people report, should they really go in? You know, I know you get like the little box usually, or the, or the check boxes of what is going on. Should they explain more? Is it is it worth their time to explain more? What helps you guys the best do your job? Job. Definitely end game. That way it can go straight into our moderation system. That's the fastest way that it's going to be looked at. If you put it in the forums, we're probably going to take it down because we don't want to build on, you know, we don't oh, need, that's you know, good, yeah. backwards Especially harassment, with, I like, guess. Especially with exploits, I guess. You don't yeah. want exploits we sitting don't want on exploits forums. forums. If you do see exploits, for example, sending those up through customer service is very helpful yes. as well. Um, but uh, any in-game issues with players, please report them. Definitely the fastest way you're going to get that looked at. We also do have a way that you can report outside of the game okay. um, as well. 
but in game is for sure the best way to go. Outside of the game, you could maybe include some additional information. Like if you were reporting bots, you could include maybe a link to a bot or something like that that's been recorded. Uh, but the quickest, fastest, and most simplest way is to report it in game. All right. Well, thank you so much. You guys have very clearly answered all my questions, and I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Thanks thank for you having us. You. All right, guys, so I spent a lot of time on the forums, Reddit, Discord, and it's constantly thrown to me that we're giving you feedback, you should listen to feedback, and we're giving you questions. Why can't our questions be answered by devs? Well, great news, guys. I gathered some of the most important questions that are asked across the board, and we're now throwing them in front of the devs. And let's start with Phil. Can you tell us a little bit more about the economy after all the server merges? Yeah, definitely. Um, so what we saw after a lot of the recent server merges and transfers, um, it was a big boon to a lot of our, of our wor worlds out there that are a lot more full, a lot more engaging. The trade posts in those worlds, are, I think, are really active, and, and the resource generation and everything that players are doing uh, on the fuller worlds is just it's, it's making the game feel really alive in those spots. I think on some of the lower population ones, it has had a bit of a negative impact to the economy. And so in those instances, we are, you know, taking a look at the size of the population in those worlds and potentially, you know, we may take uh, other actions there like server merges. Also, we're going to be introducing paid server transfers, though, um, and, and not just, you know, giving massive amounts of free server transfers out to players. So when, when they do transfer, there will be a really intentional transfer. So we shouldn't be seeing big swaths of the population, you know, pulling stakes in a, in a given world. Okay. Yeah. I just want to add on to that, yeah. that I think that it's important to call out that we are not planning to do any more free mass tokens mm -hmm. to, to the players. We're not planning to do that again. And so we need to see how things are, to, you know, to put it one way, how they shake out in the world. Yeah. Uh, and then we're always considering future merges. So future server merges when we see a population that's unhealthy. Um, or we see that the character count on a world has gone below a certain threshold, then we'll look at that and we'll, we'll merge those. And we'll, of course, give the community a heads up through forums uh, and then also in-game when that does happen. But we're watching constantly, <laughs> constantly. Okay, yeah, that's definitely great. I think people are always concerned about mm -hmm. their world, you know, and, and how we're kind of affecting it. So that's good to know. And, and now people have a little bit more control over things. Scott, especially, you wanted me to ask this um, you saw Asmin Gold had answer or asked this and wants an answer from you about the Azoth system. Do you think it had a positive effect in the game, or how do you feel? Don't look at me like that. <laughs> um, no, in, in truth, uh, it hasn't. You know, and it's a bummer because first off, you know, we don't get everything right on the first try. But the reason it's a bummer to me is I love the concept of Azoth. This, this, this mineral that flows below Eternum, that people think it has magical properties. And it felt so cool tying that to fast traveling through the world and to you know amplifying your weapons through perks and stuff. However, the way it came through in gameplay was more of like a constraint than a, than a currency of cool or fun. And for that, it's a, it's a bummer, but it did not work out the way we wanted. That said, the takeaway is we listened, we learned, and we improved it. It's fixed, and it's a lot better now. And I'm, the behavior I hope we start to see is that players are using that more and more in the crafting side to amplify their gear and like to, to really start driving their gear in the direction they want it to go. Absolutely. All right. Well, that's great to know. And also, yes, we do watch a lot of content creators and uh, take that all into consideration with these questions. I guess, Katie, especially now, when we did do the server merges before, some of the servers have been locked, some unlocked. What, what's going on with that? Are there plans to lock more? Bring yeah, us into so, that. <laughs> so we don't have any plans to preemptively lock any servers. We said in February that we were preemptively locking some servers in anticipation of the, the token going live. We don't have plans to do that ever again, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> okay. um, that could change, but at, as far as like right now, we have absolutely no plans to preemptively lock servers. However, we do have a system in place where once a world reaches a certain threshold of individual characters, of population, and a, a couple other metrics, um, it will automatically lock. 
that will sometimes unfortunately happen when a company is moving over. Um, so that, that has been an unfortunate side effect, but it's to protect the people that are on, the players that are on those worlds. Because uh, the last thing we want is for, you know, our March update to go live and then they're sitting in queues that are 12 hours long. And so we're trying our, our best to mitigate that. Um, again, why we're not gonna do another free server <laughs> transfer yeah. token. We saw what happened. Um, we understand, we, we uh, looked at those metrics and we decided that was absolutely not something that we wanted to fall into again. So uh, we will not be making that mistake. <laughs> um, hopefully this age as well. Uh, so we will not be making that mistake but, I again. I mean, like you guys are, I mean, even what we've answered so far is like, you guys are taking feedback. You yeah. are oh, making changes. Absolutely. You are adjusting things, you know, if, mm -hmm. if that doesn't go that great, you know, you guys are looking looking at other options. Absolutely, and we do, we are looking again at the worlds to see, as we mentioned, like we're looking at those worlds and we're deciding which ones need to be merged further, right? So that's gonna be a constant exercise that we're gonna be doing. It's not like a one and done. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's also why the, um, the transfer tokens going into the shop are really key because then it's not going to be thousands of people transferring at the same time. There's gonna be a little bit more friction there so that we can keep a better eye on it. Uh, and so that people make good decisions and we provide them that information to make good decisions. So it's all looking up from here as far as merges <laughs> and the tokens go. Right, we right. figured it out and, and we're, we're making really positive changes there. Okay, great. With all these transfers going on between servers, I want to talk a little bit more about, you know, activities between servers. Is that something that we're looking into? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the idea of joining people on different servers to do expeditions, um, outpost rush, at some point we'll, we'll have, you know, more casual versions of war and invasion. I think that is something we totally aspire to and I think it would be really cool. It's always fun, you know, socially connecting with people in different parts of the world and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it, it. I mean, that's a whole reason of having like an MMO, right? Is being able to play with other people. Who would have thought? Um, but that's great, especially for like the smaller servers that are having issues finding enough people for stuff. So, you know, hopefully they'll have. Right. It, I mean, it's a topic that comes up a bunch internally, and we we discuss it, and we are actively looking into you know how we pull it off and do it the right way. And so, um, we definitely want to make sure that people are able to get together and play and experience all of our cool instance content. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the tech is challenging though, so it's not something yeah. we can you know, say is gonna happen tomorrow or next month, or it's probably not gonna show up on the roadmap, but it's something we're working at. And it's one of those things you don't really wanna put on a committed roadmap, it's you wanna work until you get it right, it mm -hmm. feels really good, and then we'll just put it out. Yeah, for sure. I think the, you know, I read a lot of players are like, hey, as long as we know what's going on, you know, and take your time and make sure it's done right. So, you know, it's nice to hear that, something like that, because I can just see that being a hot mess, like being caught in limbo <laughs> between two servers it's or definitely something. definitely something we don't want to get wrong, right? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so a few of the things that we have touched on, not even a few, a lot of things is, have been changes because of players' feedback, right? But on top of that, are there any things that really come to mind that have been completely changed due to players' feedback or adjusted at all? Yeah, um, I actually have this a very clear memory from early, right, right after we launched where we had a lot of players asking for inventory while running. And I went to our, our meeting and I was like, hey, everybody's asking for this. Can we make it happen? And everybody was like, yeah, let's make it happen. We all wanted it too. We all <laughs> wanted it. We all wanted it, but that was something that the, the, the movement on that was definitely increased because players were like, this will be such a huge quality of life improvement for us. And yeah, it's, it's gonna be. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's coming. You know? You know, we have things like like right now, the, the stuff we've been talking about, the reducing friction, like that's an initiative inside in, in the office that we follow. And it's, it's constantly having, constantly going. We have another concept C to C, we call it. It's concept to customer. When, so when, when, when the player talks about something that they don't like, we immediately like, okay, can we turn this around fast? What can we do? How do we, how do we address this? Like there's more features that are in response to what players are asking for than, yeah. than on the other side of that yes. equation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like things that we've done recently in the last few months regarding uh, tax, taxes, um, access to expedition orbs, uh, all sorts of things like, you know, making sure that players have more access to those things, that we've reduced the cost of housing taxes greatly. Uh, the fast travel cost with the Azoth that we talked about yeah, earlier. Yeah, exactly. That's a yeah. good, that was great like the, example. The start of this yeah, was yeah. That was we directly, listened yeah. directly to what you said and, you know, we, we agree and mm -hmm. we're making changes based on that, so. 
our players have a big voice in those design meetings. And we're listening too, so yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, I'm personally happy to hear that too because I spend my days, you know, combing through the forums and gathering it all on a list, you know, so it's nice to know that, yes, it is being heard and used and, and going from there. Let me just add real quick, now that we're out of that launch window, you, that, that's why, like, like, if you're noticing in the patch notes, oh, they're, they're doing a lot more than they were three months ago or two months ago because we've kind of got our head above water now and we're back in that cycle we want to get in that we had in the alpha where we're turning things around really quickly based on player feedback. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's great. I mean, now we've talked a lot about PvE, you know, and I, I could already hear the PvP players being like, what about us? Um, what are the plans to uh, focus on PvP in the future? Right. In our spring season, we're going to be introducing some majorly cool features for PvP players. Wait, wait, wait. I got a roadmap coming out. Oh, yeah? Next, we're going to be talking about that in a minute. I don't know if you want to. Am, am I spoiling? Am I... Okay, go ahead and spoil it. Okay. <laughs> Small spoiler for the roadmap uh, segment. Uh, but in our spring season, we're, we're rolling out PvP-focused arenas. That'll be 3v3 uh, PvP arenas. And on top of that, uh, a full PvP rewards track where players can uh, just earn uh, PvP-specific XP and currency by doing any kind of PvP action in the game. And then uh, that would unlock access to really exclusive, prestigious PvP rewards. Ooh, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, PvP, because yeah, they, they deserve some love too. <laughs> so um, that's, and that's great to hear, honestly, uh, uh, having more of a PvP sort of thing to focus on because, yeah. We, you know, the vision hasn't changed for the game. Yeah, right? everyone like, gets love, right? Well, yeah, it's a, you know, yeah. they don't just coexist, they complement each other and we're supporting both and PvP and PvE both are very important to the future of New World. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I mean, just to kind of follow up on that with cooldowns, you know, can we talk a little bit more oh, sure. on, I know, big topic, but well, another thing that comes players. from listening <laughs> to the players. Uh, yes. Well, the, the good news is, is that Scott's going to be able to delete his spreadsheet that he uses to track all of his cooldowns in the game. So that'll be good. Uh, because uh, we're introducing global cooldowns. So yes. now everything that's on cooldown depending on the length of time of the cooldown in terms of days or, or a week, it, it'll reset at a consistent time for players in their time zone, uh, you know, uh, whenever it's ready. So let's just say uh, I've got a daily crafting cooldown. Now that's gonna reset at 5 a.m. every day. So 5 a.m. my time every day, that'll reset. If I've got something that's more on a weekly timer, uh, that those, are gonna, those will roll over on Tuesdays at 5 a.m. So 5 a.m. is kind of the time where we see really light engagement and it's a good time just to like get people uh, just to like, you know, roll it over. So the next session you join in the game, you're ready to go again. So technically he doesn't have to delete his spreadsheet, but it is greatly reduced because sure. he still you has can... weekly <laughs> cooldowns. Mm -hmm. But it is nice that if you play at nine o'clock one night and you do a bunch of stuff and then the next day you're yeah. free at six, you're not kind of like, oh, what do I do now? So now exactly. you can immediately go hit them all. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could definitely plan your, play style a bit more around those cooldowns. Yeah, so like elite chess, crafting, earning bonuses from like faction missions, those types of yeah. things, yeah. Um, th those will all be now consistently rolling over right. day over day. And as we said before, I'm sure we will listen to player feedback and, and see you know how they like that and what's going on with that. But I mean, that's it for the major questions that I have from the community. Is there anything else that you guys would like to add? Any? Anything keep else? keep the feedback coming. We appreciate it. Not just where we have room for improvement, but if you have big ideas that you want to see us implement and you are just so excited about that, put it in the forums. We read that all the time right. and we really appreciate the big ideas that our players have. Mm -hmm. All right. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much guys, and I really appreciate it. We're going to go on to the next section. Thanks. Hey guys, so this is something I'm very excited about because I spend a lot of time in Discord, the forums, Reddit, and I'm always asked, where is the roadmap? So today we're gonna dive into the roadmap. We have three seasons that Scott is gonna go into greater detail with. So Scott, take it away. Well, it starts with spring, which is March. Right now we're releasing the Tempest Heart Expedition. We've talked a lot about this today, but it's an end game expedition where you get to finally close the chapter on the story of Isabella, the Tempest. We also are releasing the Blunderbuss, which is a run and gun shotgun type of weapon. Really fun for movement combat, especially close range and everything's trying to get you close. We're releasing 3v3 PVP arenas. 
This is exciting. This is where players get to really go in and show their, their, their skill and their muster in the game, right? Because if you're in a war 50 v 50, it's kind of easy to hide if you're not good. If you get in the open world, it's, it's rarely a fair fight. This is your opportunity to show your skills. Along with that, PVP reward track. Okay. So for players that get better, we want to make sure they get rewards you know, for playing it and doing stuff. So there's a really cool reward track that goes along with that. That takes us into the summer. This summer, we have another end game expedition, Barnacles in Black Powder. I think the name gives you a hint of what you're going to run into in there. It's really exciting, and we're, we're, we're super happy to get that out there. On top of that, we have a group finder for expedition. So a lot of players have been asking for this, especially as more players get up into the 590, 600 gear and they're doing mutations. This will help you find groups and make it a lot easier. The summer is going to end with a pretty awesome summer event. We're excited. You've seen how an event is in New World. They're only going to get better as we add more, so it's pretty cool. And then in autumn, we have Brimstone Sands territory, which is this giant desert territory with a whole bunch of different AI that you've never seen in the game. We're introducing a new culture, and it comes with the Inead, its own expedition. This is an end game, going to be one of the harder expeditions in the game. It is not for the faint of heart. Another big request we've heard from a lot of players is for another new weapon. So uh, I'm happy to officially announce the Great Sword is happening. Ah. <laughs> and it is epic. This thing is huge, and it's going to live up to the name of the Great Sword. We have leaderboards coming, which aren't going to be just for PvP leaderboards. They're also going to be for PvE activities, which is pretty cool. And then a couple more events. We have a Halloween event coming, and then, you know, you can't really have a Thanksgiving without Turculon. Of course. So uh, Turculon 2022 is coming, and those of you that remember last year's, we have a few new surprises to put in for this year. Overall, we're really excited. And it doesn't just stop, you know, this is the feature list that, like, this is the roadmap we're out committed to. We also have new mutations coming. We have balance changes coming, bug fixes. And we have a team that just responds to, to, to stuff that people ask us for in live. Mm -hmm. So if you see other features work their way in, it's because we're listening to players and we're putting stuff out that they're asking for. Right. That's awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Scott, going into greater detail of the roadmap. I'm sure players are going to be super excited to kind of pull this apart. So here they go. There you go, guys, the roadmap for the upcoming three seasons. And that concludes the dev video for this month. I mean, I'm really excited. We touched on a lot of hot topics that are constantly asked on the forums. And Scott, is there anything else that you want to add? Just a special thank you to the player support team for coming out and answering questions. Like, they're the front lines of the game and we appreciate them. Absolutely. So, I mean, just one last quick question for you is what are we going to be working on next month? Next month is all about Bugs, bots, and balance, again, we're going to deep dive on all of those. We're, you know, we hear the community saying they want us to spend more time on that. That's what we're going to do. Absolutely. All right, and thank you guys so much for joining us today. My name's Tina Dagenhart, also known as Shadow Fox on the forums, and I hope to see you all there.